During this season of Lent, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil. All that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we are called at baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and with one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and an ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join in singing hymn 461.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son established a new covenant for all people. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these signs of our life and faith may speak again to our hearts, feed our spirits, and refresh our bodies. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The psalm for today will be read responsibly as marked, Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid a hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, our God is merciful. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. A reading from the first book of Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Please stand as we welcome the gospel. The Gospel is from St. Mark, the 14th chapter. You can uh, put down your bulletins. I'm going to read a little more than those three verses that I chose for whatever reason weeks ago. We're going to start on verse 12. <clears throat> on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to go and make a preparations for you eat the Passover? So Jesus sent out two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, and follow him. And where he enters, say to the owner of that house, The teacher asks where my guest room is, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. 
and he will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. So the disciples set out, and they went to the city, and they found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. And when it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and they were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me now. And they began to be distressed and to say to one another, Surely it's not I. And Jesus said, It is one of the twelve who is dipping his bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one never to have been born at all. And so while they were eating, they took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, Jesus broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Take, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So at uh, Messiah, we uh, generally have fourth graders come to First Communion, uh, and, uh, and we have three classes for them where we teach them about communion, and on the very last class, we show them how to take communion. And, and I wanted to share this evening uh, about uh, how, what those things that are we to tell them. Um, and, and when I teach that last class, I, I always start by telling them what my pastor told me when I was their age and taking this class. He told me how to uh, drink the cup of wine. He said that when you drink the cup of wine, you are not ever to tilt your head. You are to only move your hand like this when you drink it. And we asked why, and that made him grow very impatient and even angry. And he said, because you're not a cowboy in some Western getting a shot of whiskey. <laughs> to which all of us who are fifth graders or so are <laughs> thinking, well, we've never been a cowboy getting any sort of whiskey. <laughs> this is God's house. So I always tell the kids that too, because it makes me laugh. And they look at me just as perplexed as we looked at him. <laughs> So lesson one is never tilt your head when you're drinking your wine. Just tilt your arm. And then the other things I go on to tell them is that when they come forward, they're to have their hands out like this, is what I say. When you come forward, you're to have your hands out like this. And, and I always tell them that the reason you want your hands out like this is because that's an act of begging. And, and you're, it, it's, it's an act that you aren't coming forward to get anything that you're entitled to. You aren't coming forward for any other reason than someone has offered you a good gift. And, uh, and, and, there's, um, and there's not only not an entitlement in that, there's also not an exclusivity in that either. That you aren't coming forward because of who you are, whether you're a right person or a righteous person even, even whether you're the right sort of Christian, you're coming forward because of who God is, the sort of God God is. Generous and reacts to those who are in need, and you're in need. So when you come forward, put your hands out like that, is what I tell. And it also helps me know who's in fourth grade so I can know who to commune, too. <laughs> I don't tell them that part. And, and then the, the next thing I tell them is a little more complicated for them. I tell them when they come forward, their face should be happy and sad. And, and then we try to make happy and sad faces. Right, Bob, exactly. You know, you try to <laughs> contort your face. And fourth graders find that fun for about a minute and a half, you know, where you're trying to do that. And, 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 and I tell them uh, that you're happy to because that's kind of the polar opposites of this moment of communion. You know, a, a mixture of sadness and happiness. 
And, and the way I get there is I start with this, this ritual that we remember tonight on Monday Thursday uh, worship here at Messiah. I mean, it, it begins right as a meal that Jesus has with the disciples, and it's a Jewish Passover meal. And we think of just the 12 disciples being there because we've all seen the photograph by Michelangelo, so we know. But, but behind the photograph and the parts that you can't see are um, many disciples. Mark makes that clear, that the room is large and that there's men and women, female and male disciples in that room. And, and the 12 are sitting at a table with Jesus. Kind of think of a wedding. Kind of think of a wedding. And, and, and when you're at a wedding, those people that mean the most to you at that wedding are sitting at that kind of head table. So all these people in this room are the closest people to Jesus, right? And at the table are the very closest people to Jesus. And even though Jesus is in this room with these close people, it feels sad. It feels sad. Something less than a celebration is going on. And what's on Jesus' mind that he talks about with them is suffering. The suffering that he's going to endure and the suffering that the disciples are going to endure too. And Jesus begins this meal with the great conversation starter, if you heard it there. I mean, as soon as everybody sits down, the first thing he says to them is, one of you guys is going to betray me. <laughs> one of you guys sitting at this table right here. I don't know where you go next with that conversation. And Mark says, everyone got defensive, well, it wasn't me. And if you would have read verse 11 and 10 right before where we started, we know it's already Judas. He's already done, done the deed. He starts there, and then at the end of the meal, he says, all of you are going to deny me. <laughs> all 12 of you are going to deny, deny me. And we get a sense that the suffering that Jesus is talking about at this last meal, you know, we think right away that it, it's about physical suffering, right? Which surely it is. The, the, the torture and the execution that he's about to endure. But it's also about some level of emotional suffering, of simply being let down by the people that are closest to you, the people that you thought you could trust, you hoped you could trust, and now you find out you can't. So when we talk about the suffering of Jesus, it's not just his body, it's also his heart, too. And, and then Jesus lifts up the bread, right? And he lifts up the bread and he, this loaf of bread, which is problematic for Passover, but we'll let scholars worry about that piece of it. He, he lifts up this, this loaf of bread and he says, take, this is my body. And when Jesus says take, someone I, I, I read today said that, that Jesus is almost asking the world to take his body. This, this loaf of bread, it represents his body, and the word for body that's used isn't like fleshy body itself. So take my entire self, world. <laughs> Do what you can with it. If suffering's what it is, then suffer I will. If betrayal and denial what it is, then, then that's what it is. Take. Take me. I, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to die to this world. Because in the kingdom of man where Jesus finds himself, suffering comes to people who are righteous in the world. But what we might miss is that when he then tells the disciples to take this loaf of bread that is the body of his suffering, then they start participating in that suffering too. He's telling them, <laughs> take this bomb <laughs> that I'm going to give you. Because this is now who you're going to be when you eat this bread. You're going to be part of my suffering. When we think about the real presence of Jesus that's in this bread and this wine, it means the real experiences of Jesus. We take on Jesus' suffering. We are become part of the suffering of this world because the kingdom of man does not reward righteousness with anything but suffering in this world. 
So I tell the fourth graders that they're to make a sad face when they come forward. Because this good gift that they, that they don't deserve, <laughs> and that often they never even honor the God who brings it to them, makes God sad at times. For the betrayal and the denial of the world that God loves so much. And our sadness is part of God's sadness in us and in our world. And our sadness, too, is about the journey of being faithful in this world. Suffering like Jesus suffers in this world. Turning the other cheek, loving enemies, (laughs) giving wealth to people in poverty, sacrificing time and talents for a world that's in need but rarely says thank you. Not huge things but all a piece of sadness for us. And the real presence of Jesus is mixed into that suffering. We're in solidarity with the suffering of our Lord when we come forward for communion. So I tell them to make a sad face. And then I tell them to make a happy face, too. And the happy face is because somewhere in the midst of the suffering, Jesus is inviting you to a party. (laughs) In the Mark text, he tells the disciples that are gathered there in that large room, the many disciples, males and females, 12 at the center. He tells them that this wine symbolizes the blood of the covenant that is poured out. Well, we can figure out what blood of the covenant blood poured out means, right? We're talking about more suffering. That's part of our Christian walk. But the covenant piece is a new sort of word. Covenant is like a contract, a deal. <laughs> and and it's, it's a, a new covenant. It's a new deal that's for all of us. And that deal is the resurrection. I won't drink wine again, he says, until I drink it in the kingdom of God. This new kingdom, this kingdom of God that Jesus has been preaching on from the very beginning of Mark. This new kingdom is what the resurrection looks like. And the resurrection is our future. It's our future where Jesus already waits for us. The sacrifice, the suffering, the death, it it all leads to resurrection. You don't get to resurrection without death. It just doesn't happen. Death leads to resurrection. And that resurrection is the good news that we hear in communion. And the resurrection of Jesus is not about him coming back to life, being resuscitated so that he's part of the kingdom of man only to suffer all over again. The resurrection is about a place where love rules and suffering is over. It's about a place that Jesus describes most often as a party, a feast that won't have any other end. And you know what they're serving at this feast? Plenty of wine. And that wine is offered forward when you come forward. That wine that these fourth graders hate to drink and I make them drink it. Jesus is in that resurrection waiting for us now. Waiting with that party. And when we come forward with our hands out with sadness at the suffering in the world, we also come forward with the knowledge that we are walking towards this party that Jesus has thrown for us. Not because of what we've done, but solely because who we are, a child of God. The good news I tell the fourth graders is that that party is waiting for you. And you're invited to come forward with your hands out, begging for this bread and wine and always being said yes to when you do. And that sometimes you're going you're gonna to be honed in on the suffering and sadness. And, and a sad face is going to be the, the, the thing that you should take that communion with. Because be assured that whatever burden you bring to communion with you that Sunday 
our Lord knows. And he's in solidarity with you in it. That's what real presence means. And some days you're going to understand that dying to this world (laughs) is the only way to find out what life and living looks like. And you're going to have a kick in your step as you come forward for that wine. And you put the biggest, best smile on your face on that day. Because our Lord is excited to see you in the resurrection where he's waiting. And when you can't figure out whether to be happy or sad, I always tell him this at the end. Be happy. (laughs) Be happy. Because whether you get it or not, God gets it. And he's got you. And God's happy. And there's no other reason to have a smile on your face than how pleased our Lord is when we come forward. Amen. While I was coming forward to sing, we'll take up an offering during this anthem.
this hymn, hymn 469, lead in to our Eucharistic prayers, our prayers of thanksgiving around our bread and wine this morning or evening. So please stand, open your hymnals to 469 as we prepare to eat. God, in this large room full of your disciples, men and women called to be near you, to walk in your way, meet us here tonight, Lord, around this meal of bread and wine. In this loaf, may we find your presence. In this wine, May we find our invitation. Help us hear again the words and the promise of Jesus. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we proclaim the very mystery of faith. That Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, Meet us in the sacrament of communion. Relieve our suffering. Invite us to the feast that has no end. Let us die to this world tonight and live for the resurrection. 
that is all of our future. Come, Holy Spirit, make us your church. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll commune our assistance first, and then bring this forward for all to eat. If you're visiting tonight, please know that you are invited to eat with us. This isn't a Lutheran meal. It's simply Christ's meal. And the body is welcome for all children of God. Blood of Christ shed for you. feast awaits you. Come and eat.
stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you in his grace. Lord Jesus, in this wonderful sacrament, you have strengthened us with the saving power of your suffering, your death, and your resurrection. May the sacrament of your body and blood so work in us the fruits of your redemption and show us forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I encourage you to return tomorrow night at the end of this service for our Good Friday service at 7.30 and on Saturday night for a small intimate Saturday vigil uh, that begins in Fritz Hall as we wait and hope for the resurrection. Let us sing, Go to Dark Gethsemane, as we prepare for our tenebrae. Verses 1 through 3. You may be seated. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. forsaken me why so far from saving me so far from the words of my groaning my god i cry out by day but you do not answer by night i find no rest yet you are the holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted and you rescued them. My
Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them when no crowd was present. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not human, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord, let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him, if God so delights in him. My God, my God, why have you Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many young bulls answer, call me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. My He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. They open wide their jaws at me like a slashing and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of death. Packs of dogs close me in. A band of evildoers circles round me. They pierce my hands and my feet. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, be not far away. O oh, my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild bulls, you have rescued me. declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. My Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in all of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. My God. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping other insults on him. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust Though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. My God. 